Hello, my name is Lindsay Kernut. I'm with Heritage Action, and today we are talking about the bipartisan infrastructure deal and the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill. I have with us two experts. They're former Hill staffers and now Heritage Action staffers. We're going to break down this bill, what's in it, what the tax creases are going to be for you, and um, what that means for you guys at home. So I have with us R.J. Gibson, a former Senate staffer and now the lead um, on our Senate team. And then I have Walker Gallman, the lead on our House side, and he's a former House side staffer as well. So let's start off just talking about what these two bills are, what's in them, and let's just break it down for folks. Absolutely. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so just to kind of bring everyone up to speed on, on where we are, there exists two major Democrat initiatives right now. One is what's called the BIF, or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Deal, uh, and then the other one is their reconciliation package. So what this means is that they have two bills that are essentially linked right now. Uh, the passage of one depends on the passage of other. We'll get into the politics of that here in a minute, but for now, what, what's really important to understand is we're looking at about $5 trillion in spending between the two bills, and that's just what they're going to tell you. If, on the inside, you know, the number is always going to be much higher until they whittle things down, if they whittle things down. Uh, so those are still in the works. You know, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure deal has already gone through the Senate. Uh, it's sitting in the House now. Uh, you've got, you know, factions wanting it to pass, factions not wanting it to pass on both sides of the aisle. The politics of this are extremely complicated. And, and just know that folks at home can expect a lot of tricks from Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer on this situation. Oh, definitely. I mean, they're packing this with whatever liberal priority they want. I mean, it's, it's everything is in there. So, RJ, talk to us about the reconciliation bill, what tax increases are in there. I know there's a lot of hidden little fees in there. Yeah, so the, the, the reconciliation bill is... Um, is as Walker said, lots of spending, but they're, they're financing that spending by raising your taxes. So um, they're actually talking about $2.2 trillion in new taxes, which would be the largest tax increase uh, in the United States in 50 years. Um, and so you're talking about increases in individual rates, in rates that businesses pay, um, small businesses, big businesses, kind of everybody. Um, and so that's going to that's gonna be bad for the economy. It's going to shrink, shrink the economy. It's going to cost jobs, it's going to depress people's wages, um, and, and you know, it's going to be felt by uh, the people at the bottom of the income brackets the most. Oh wait, I thought Biden said he wasn't increasing taxes on the middle class. Oh no, but, but, but he is. Um, of course. So <laughs> that's another broken promise. Um, you know, some of the, the provisions in here explicitly break that promise. Um, he's talking about doubling the tobacco tax. Um, you know, it's not just people who make more than $400,000 a year who, who use tobacco products their tax bill is going to go up because of this. Um, you're talking about taxing, uh, putting a tax on, on methane production. Methane is, is natural gas. Um, so, you know, again, people who live paycheck to paycheck are trying to make ends meet, and their energy bills are going to go up because of this. It's easy for people in, um, you know, who, who are, live comfortably um, to, to stomach a, a, a small percentage increase in their energy bill. Um, but it's much more difficult for people who live, um, you know, paycheck to paycheck, and that's that's who these proposals are going to hurt the most. And that's not even talking about, um, you know, the, the the inflation that we're going to see because of all this spending, which is a t is essentially a tax on your wages. Um, and and as I said earlier, you know, the increase in business taxes ultimately is going to be paid for by workers. Research shows that that, that is the case, and and so you know, you're talking about taxes on essentially every American who participates in the economy. And just um, more Biden and inflation, too. And more Biden inflation, and that's all used to finance um, you know, a liberal wish list of policies that, that I, I think Walker's going to talk a little bit about. Yeah, I have. We just tweeted out earlier this week, actually, we have a sneak peek of some of the policies that Democrats are trying to sneak into this bill. They tried to put an amnesty for $8 million, if I'm if I'm correct. Massive tax hikes. We've got free community college, taxing and regulating the prices of drugs, mandating funding for abortion, Green New Deal revolution. Can you talk more about these policies? Absolutely, and I'm glad you brought up the immigration because it's actually an important piece of this. So the immigration piece that Lindsay just mentioned, uh, you know, would get amnesty to about 8 million individuals uh, were to be included. However, thankfully, they're in, in a rare moment of, of good things coming out of Congress. The, in order to include that provision in the reconciliation bill, they have to go and talk to uh, an individual known as the Senate parliamentarian, who is what you would call the referee of what can and can't be included in Senate bills. Uh, and so in this case, she decided that it was inappropriate to grant amnesty to 8 million immigrants, illegal or otherwise, 
uh, you know, in, in one foul swoop. It, it, it's very irrelevant. A reconciliation bill is meant to be a spending bill. A and adding 8 million immigrants and giving them, you know, citizenship, that's nothing to do with spending. That's what I was just about the, to say. They, How they, does that have anything to do with They have with a very spending? veiled <laughs> argument that is in no way correct. And as proven by the Senate parliamentarian, it didn't fly. Now, this isn't something we should forget about. They haven't forgotten about it. They're working on some other tricks to try and work this in, in another form. Uh, you know, kind of Trojan horse it into the bill. So we got to stay vigilant and see what their next move is there. But that's only one of a plethora of problems. Well, and let's be clear that, you know, just even if they aren't able to include this, it's something that they want to do. This is a radical idea. It is something that they are trying to do. And if they could do it, they would. Uh, I think it's important that just, even if it doesn't make it into the final bill, voters need to hold them accountable for, for the fact that they're trying to do this. Sure. Exactly. It's like playing poker while showing me all of your cards. I, I already know what, you, what your hand is. Uh, but on top of that, like I said, immigration is just the tip of the iceberg in the terrible things coming out of this bill. A couple other things, for example, we got three and a half billion dollars to start a new program called the Civilian Climate Corps uh, Corporation, which is basically the government funding activist training for climate activism. And so we're going to have the government training up an army of Greta Thunbergs to go out and tell you how to live your life. And we just can't have that. That's unacceptable. Uh, then on top of that, there's a $4 billion provision in there to get rid of bridges that Democrats have deemed to be racist. And yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I said. They have found bridges that they feel divide communities of color from other communities. And because of that, these bridges are racist. And we know what happens when a Democrat calls something racist. It's got to go. So, you know, right now when we're talking about infrastructure, you'd think, we want to build bridges, repair bridges. But no, Democrats are over here trying to destroy bridges because somehow a bridge can be racist. So that's something. I mean, it'd be comical. I'm laughing, but it, it's insane this amount of money. That's oh, right. Spending. No, it's I wish dangerous. this was a joke. Yeah. I, I wish it were a joke, but unfortunately it's not. The, the Democratic Party is a joke, but this is not. Uh, so on, on top of that, you know, the other thing that everyone's going to immediately be able to recognize is just the massive amount of Green New Deal provisions in this. Just on top of the three and a half trillion I just, billion I just mentioned for the Climate Corporation, our Civilian Climate Corporation, you know, there's a bunch of other provisions designed to, you know, mitigate climate effects that they're saying are ruining the economy. You know, everything is infrastructure these days, according to the Democrats, and they'll stop at nothing. And then on top of that, it, continuing their crusade for, you know, energy efficiency and, and climate regulation, they're looking to get rid of and completely electrify the entire government fleet of cars. So we're talking about every government vehicle you've ever seen right now, for the most part, gas powered, uh, you know, standard car that you'd see on the road any day. What the Biden administration wants to do is they want to take your tax dollars to buy expensive electric cars, which they already subsidize. So they are subsidizing their own electric vehicle purchases at the moment on your taxpayer dollars. And when have you woken up in the morning and thought, God, my life would be better if everyone at the government drove an electric vehicle? You haven't. And there's no reason to start doing that now. You know, electric vehicles are great if you're wealthy and you want to go get them, but that's not the focus right now. We've got oh. crisis on the border. We've got, you know, problems in Afghanistan. We've got problems here at home Inflation. trying to keep the economy going. Well, of course, and, Democrats want to give uh, tax tax cuts to, to wealthy folks who can buy, can afford electric vehicles as well. Exactly. So, you know, when you look at a bill like this, you got to ask yourself, who are they trying to help? Because it doesn't seem like they're trying to help you, not trying to help me. So who is it that they're working for right now? I, what about tax the rich? I thought that was the whole talking points for the Democrats right now. It's, I'm, it's I'm really, it, you know, they say tax the rich, but what they mean is tax the rich people who don't vote for us. Um, sure. you know, there's a concerted effort right now, we don't know if it's going to make it into the bill, to, uh, to repeal the, the cap on state and local tax deductions. Um, mm, yeah. Who does that go to? That goes to wealthy people in New York, in coasts. California, the coastal elites. Um, those are the people who, who that benefits, and those people vote for Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it's tax the rich unless they vote for us. Very true. You got that right, RJ. So we've got electric vehicle, electric vehicles in this, tanking down bridges. We've got, you know, what is it, tobacco tax? We've got everything in there. This is the Democrats' chance, I feel like, to get their liberal priorities through, get what they want in this bill. So talk to me about what they're thinking right now. What is Pelosi thinking? What's Schumer thinking? How's AOC fit into this and the left wing of the party? Let's let's talk about the politics here. Yeah, you know, this is their chance, they feel like, to, to get everything they want. So they're throwing everything at the wall. Everything at the wall, and they're going to see what's At least $3.5 Well, <laughs> Well, yeah, it's about half of what the progressives wanted. Um, but, you know, so I think we should start um, by just talking a little bit about the process. So, you know, 
ever since the, the election, um, Democrats have been talking about how they're going to tax and spend. Um, they're going to set up this agenda. Um, so we all know this is coming. We've known this is coming. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, some political, some not, uh, a, group of, a group of moderate senators on both sides of the aisle decided to sit down and try to work on a, a bipartisan infrastructure. And that deal. was earlier this summer, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what took up a lot of time this summer. You heard a lot about it, I'm sure. Um, and so they sat down they, and they negotiated, right? That's, you know, kind of how Congress is supposed to work. Um, but at the same time, Democrats told everyone and set in motion the, uh, the, the mechanisms to pursue this other tax and spending spree, right? Uh, Three and a half trillion dollars. And they told everyone we're going to do this, right? So on one hand, you have this group negotiating, um, and, and it's comical because they're, they're negotiating and, and Republicans are saying, we, this is a red line for us. We can't vote for any, any, any new taxes. It's supposed right? to be bipartisan. Right? That's the idea in a negotiation. I give some, you give some. Mm -hmm. So ta Repu Republicans say, we, we, we're not going to raise taxes to pay for this, right? We're gonna, mm -hmm. If we're going to do this, like, that's a red line for us. And Democrats say, okay, that'll fall out, right? And so it falls out of the, the bipartisan package, and what, what happens to it? It immediately ends up in this, uh, this Democrat-only reconciliation bill. Yeah. That's not negotiating, right? That's, that's trying to have your cake and eat it, too. That's so that moderate Democrats can go back to their districts and say, look, I'm bipartisan. I worked on this deal. And then they can also go back to their progressive activists and say, look, I got you everything you wanted. So I'm going to stop you there. It really sounds like what this is, it's a vote for infrastructure is also a vote I mean, for it, this, this reconciliation package. It, that, it, absolutely, is it, is? it absolutely is. And I think we should be clear, too. The infrastructure package is, aside from being crafted by bad faith negotiations. It's a it's a bad bill, right? Mm. Um, it's it's not a conservative one either. No, there's there's lots this. of bad bad provisions um, in it, and 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 you know, one of the supposed red lines of this group that put the bill together is that it was going to be paid for. Um, well, when CBO, the congressional the congressional budget office, nonpartisan entity, um, you know, they're they're like the scorekeeper. Uh, when they did their analysis, they said it was going to be $256 billion in deficit spending. Um, this came out just a few days before the Senate voted on the bill, um, and, and the negotiators of this bill kind of blew it off and said, well, their math is wrong, uh, as if a bunch of U.S. senators with no background in statistics or, yeah, calculus, <laughs> are somehow going to, be, going to be right, right? We've yeah. seen how Congress deals with, with math and money. I, I'm mm -hmm. not optimistic that they're right. Uh, and so... They went ahead and they, they passed this bill anyway. Um, it's not a good bill, like we said, but they did. So we key voted against it, right? We did key vote yeah. against it. Um, you know, it's, it's on our website. You can see we lay out all the bad provisions mm -hmm. um, that are in the bill. And, and so um, it did pass uh, with, with 69 votes, uh, or 60, 68 votes, I think. Um, uh, 18 Republicans voted for it. Um, and so it, it kicked it over to the House. Um, and I'll, I'll let Walker lay out kind of the, dynam the dynamics in the House since then. Yeah, where's the politics um, at? I because, know the left wing mm -hmm. of the party is upset as well. Let's let's talk through that as well. Right, so what's important to look at here is this isn't necessarily a debate between just Republicans and Democrats. This is a debate between Democrats and Democrats, first and foremost. You've got two factions in their party. You've got your, your moderates and you've got your progressives, and both have wildly different priorities. So right now, Nancy Pelosi is trying to run a goat farm, and you've got some sheep who've snuck into the herd, and she's trying to separate them and please both crowds. So you've got your, your moderates who are wanting to, who have got concerns all across the board uh, on reconciliation, whether it be the top-level spending number that they're doing in the bill, individual provisions ranging from things like drug pricing and taxes. Uh, you know, they've got some very valid concerns regardless of their party, and, and so. At the same time, these same moderate, moderate Democrats are also very much in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure deal that we've been talking about. And, and they've actually made that their priority more so than the reconciliation package. Uh, where on the other side of this situation, you have your progressives uh, who are, are generally crazy. AOC, and, Jayapal. Like, a, AOC, the Jayapal, the squad, Tlaib, yes. the, the squad. Everyone you've ever seen on TV being mad about something they shouldn't be mad about uh, <laughs> is going to be part of that problematic group. And so what their demands are is when you look at the three and a half trillion dollars that we're already looking to spend in this reconciliation package, they look at that and say, that is too small of a number. And that's crazy to 3. me. 3.5 trillion? 3.5 oh, yeah. trillion is too small for them. And so that's a red line to begin with. 
Uh, moderates think $3.5 trillion is too big. Uh, and if you look to someone in the Senate like Joe Manchin, they've point, pinned it more to about $1.5 trillion. Again, still a massive number, but that's a $2 trillion gap between these two dollars. groups of people. Uh, your taxpayer dollars. It's well, not money just doesn't come out of thin air. It's our money that's being spent, which is just insane. Exactly. And, and then what makes this even more complicated, like RJ was saying, these bills are absolutely linked. And, and this situation couldn't be more clear because of the infrastructure deal and the situation we find ourselves in. So in order to start reconciliation, it required another vote to set the framework for what that reconciliation bill would be like. In order to get to that point, they needed moderate Democrats to vote yes on that so they could start working on this reconciliation bill and writing it. Moderate Democrats, in a rare moment of growing a spine somewhat, decided to prevent them from moving forward on that until they were guaranteed a vote on the infrastructure deal. So progressives, however, didn't want that. They say no infrastructure deal until reconciliation has passed both chambers, meaning they are saying that these are connected. You cannot pass one without the other. However, moderate Democrats weren't okay with that. So the demand that they made was that they needed a guaranteed time to vote on that infrastructure deal before the reconciliation package. That date was loosely agreed to be next Monday, the 27th of September, uh, but that's not a guarantee. Uh, Speaker Pelosi could very easily yank the rug out from under them and not have that vote. But at the same time, you have progressives threatening to tank the bill if they give it a vote that day, which adds even more problems for the Democrats because the red lines in the Senate, which I think RJ will kind of lay into more here, is that if the, if the infrastructure deal doesn't get a vote Monday, Senator, Chris, or Sinema, Senator Sinema is a no, no matter what that reconciliation bill looks for. If that infrastructure package also fails and does get a vote, Senator Sinema is also going to be a no, regardless of reconciliation, or at least that's what she says. Uh, Joe Manchin is in a similar camp. So when you look at the math uh, right, right now, you know, Pelosi's got a lot of problems. There, there's a couple people in her party who she wouldn't have expected got wise to her tricks and antics, but this time they have. And, and so in a, in a rare ray of sunshine in a democratic rainstorm, we have this problem where they're having to overcome pleasing two very different groups of people within their own party. Those who are way out in cuckoo land asking for $10 trillion to, to send your kids to a climate school to learn how to be activist and, and become super woke and, and this everything that you would fear for your kids and the future and the future of America. And so it, it's vital right now that Republicans not support any of this. When it comes to infrastructure, the, the loose count on how many Republicans could potentially vote for it is somewhere between eight to 10 members. Now, a few folks are already out there publicly saying they're gonna vote for it. But what's important here is, as I mentioned before, this right now doesn't have any path forward. Senator or Leader McConnell over in the Senate has made it very clear that this is not something that they're gonna handle or they're not tolerating. Reconciliation won't pass. Then you've got, you know, Manchin and Cinema who've drawn their red lines on the infrastructure bill. So the problem here is where, where do we go? Because yeah, if Republicans vote for it, they, what, have, what did they get? They get nothing. They, yeah. they voted for a bad bill that's not gonna go anywhere. So there, well, there's really no incentive for them to vote for it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, you know, it's important here to remember how thin the margins are in Congress, right? You have a 50-50 Senate with, with Vice President Harris breaking a tie, and you have uh, a th essentially a three-vote margin in the House, um, and, and with a very wide ideological divide be between Democrats. Um, and, and so Republicans should not bail out Democrats here, right? Progre the, Democrats are in disarray. Uh, and it's, it's clear. They're it's clear, right now. Right? They're the ones that are having these internal debates, these inter internal discussions. And Why do Republicans and conservatives need to really bend the knee here? Absolutely. Um, you know, this is the time to turn up the pressure, not turn mm. it down. Because um, as Walker said, there's no path forward, right? Um, progressives, there, there's 96 progressives in the Progressive Caucus, I think, it's around there. They said they're going to vote against the bill. You know, there's only, they, Pelosi can only lose three. 96 is a hell of a lot more than three. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so, so the only way they can overcome that is with Republican help. And Democrats in the Senate have said if the, if the bipartisan bill dies, then so does reconciliation. So if Republicans vote to bail out Democrats to pass the bipartisan bill, they're essentially voting to give a path, to give new life to this reconciliation bill, which will die with the bipartisan bill. It so, sounds like really we need to turn up the pressure right now. Absolutely. I think that's the, really what conservatives, Republicans, 
in the House and the Senate need to hear from Americans, their constituents, yes. to hear about why this is bad, why they shouldn't be um, agreeing with the Democrats, going along with them. And I think this is really the time for people across America to be calling their congressmen, calling their senators, regardless of party. It really sounds like there's still a lot to be worked out here. We've got to turn up the pressure on these these moderate Congress or moderate conservatives, excuse me. And Heritage Action has that all on our website. We have a tool that you can use to find your member of Congress. You can figure out their their phone number. You can email them. You can send a letter to them. But they need to hear from you. They need to hear from the constituents and hear about why they don't want 3.5 trillion plus of our taxpayer dollars to be spent on a liberal party, the liberal wish list. So um, I think we're just going to end it there. Thank you so much for joining me. But Thanks for having us. We need, we need you guys at home. We really need you to call your congressman, get involved, push back on this. This fight is not finished, and I think we can really, really turn the pressure here. So thanks so much for joining us today. This, this is a great discussion, and hope to have more.